Uh, we need a room. Uh, maybe I sit here. Yeah, uh, so you can turn it slightly to orange. <laughs> Bueno, buenas tardes. Bienvenidos a una sesión más del Seminario Universitario Sociedad Medio Ambiente e Instituciones. Hoy es, tenemos una sesión de honor, una sesión eh, muy especial. Están con nosotros este, invitados internacionales, miembros del Comité de Políticas Públicas de las Naciones Unidas. So, welcome. It's an honor for, for all of us to, to have you here. I mean, I just said that you are members of the CDP, and this is uh, a very important session. I mean, it's the end of the academic semester. Estamos al final del, del semestre académico. Tenemos poca gente, desgraciadamente, pero, pero creo que vamos a aprovechar este, muy bien. Y sin tomar mucho tiempo, quiero decir que el tema de hoy, del día de hoy es un tema de importancia creciente en términos de política pública, en términos de análisis de prácticamente cualquier dominio de la vida pública y social, y es el tema de desigualdad, es la meta del combate a la desigualdad, es la meta número 10 de las metas de desarrollo sostenible de Naciones eh, Unidas, y creo que, que implica una una, un cambio de paradigma o sea, en términos epistemológicos, metodológicos y de diseño de política pública y también de agenda política. Entonces, yo me voy a pasar a la cabina de traducción este, y sean todos muy bienvenidos y sean bienvenidos nuestros invitados. Nos hace el honor, el favor de presidir este, el doctor del Instituto de Investigación de investigaciones económicas, entonces muchas gracias. Me voy para... Okay, hello everyone. I have the pleasure of presenting uh, Dr. Sakiko Fukuda Parr. Uh, she is professor of international affairs, the new school, development economist working in a multidisciplinary framework of capabilities and human development. Her current research topics concern human rights and economic policy and global goal setting as a policy tool. Previous positions include lead author and director UNDP Human Development Reports, and recent publications include Fulfilling Social and Economic Rights, Human Rights and the Capability Approach, an Interdisciplinary Conversation, The Power of Numbers, a Critical Review of MDG Targets for Human Development and Human Rights, Feminist and Critical Perspectives on the Financial Economic Crisis, and numerous papers and book chapters. She serves on the board of the International Association for Feminist Economics and several other non-governmental organizations that advocate human rights 
and Technology for Development. She is a graduate of Cambridge University, the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy, and University of Sussex. Okay, please. How do I, uh, <clears throat> so thank you very much for the uh, opportunity to speak with um, with you about my um, my work. Um, I'm going to be talking about this recent publication that just came out a couple of months ago, um, uh, which is a uh, critical assessment of the Millennium Development Goals. Um, most people look at the things like the Millennium Development Goals and the Sust Sustainable Development Goals as something that's you know great, and that we and they ask, how do we implement these goals? I have a very different question to these goals. I say, uh, do these goals do any good as policy instruments? And um, so <clears throat> I'm actually quite critical of the kinds of effects that the Millennium Development Goals had. They are considered to be a success, but actually they are success because they simply drew attention. And, you know, some people say one of the most resonant and unifying agreements. And so it's a sort of a success story for donors that want to manage, coordinate the actions of different <clears throat> donors. But there's no, no evidence that they made any difference. There's no counterfactual that if you didn't have the goals, you would have had the same level of poverty reduction. For example, there was massive reduction of absolute poverty in the, in the world. That was mostly driven by China. And one should ask, did the Chinese government do poverty reduction because there was the UN MDGs? <laughs> they probably would have done all of that they did anyway. So you, you wonder really what was the effect. Um, the main thing about them, therefore, is that they communicate very well. They're an instrument of communication. Uh, it's really not a policy of any kind. And the reason why they're so powerful as a communication tool is because they're simple, they're quantitative, and they're very concrete. So instead of having some very complicated co explanation of a development objective, and trying to explain to somebody what development is, you can just say every child should be in school. So it's very simple, very quantitative, very concrete. But actually, these strengths are also weaknesses because you are communicating about development in terms that are so simple that you dumb down and simplify this idea of development. You reduce what, what it is. And then you, you reduce these intangible, complicated, qualitative changes in society into something uh, that is concrete. And you're using quantitative indicators, and it's those quantitative indicators that are very reductionist, uh, because you're explaining what is poverty, and you're saying, well, that's about living on less than a dollar a day. Um, but we all know that poverty as a lived experience has a lot more to do with things like dignity and autonomy and being able to do the things that you value. So you can't uh, explain that in numbers. So, but what happens is that once you define poverty as living on less than a dollar a day or you communicate poverty as living on less than a dollar a day, you begin to redefine that concept of poverty as living on less than a dollar a day. And this, what, this is what happens. For example, intelligence is a complex thing. And once you introduce IQ, a measurement tool, people think that IQ is the definition of poverty, I mean, of, of intelligence. Um, and it also has this distorting policy effects because the, the MDG indicators were supposed to be monitoring tools. But actually, you try to make these indicators and targets into uh, planning tools and planning targets. And, and that distorts your planning priorities. So um, this book 
is um, talking about MDGs in the context of a competition of ideas. So there are a lot of ideas. MDGs are a vehicle for ideas, ideas about what development is, what development priorities are, but you use the MDGs to communicate that. And um, so, um, uh, but somehow the ideas that these MDGs contain won. And what they did is they actually replaced original ideas about what development was. For decades, for half a century, people thought development meant transforming economies. Now it's about ending absolute poverty. Um, and by defining development in this uh, new way of uh, and creating a narrative about development as poverty, um, you actually eliminate certain important priorities out of the conversation about, uh, about development. And so you have all these off the table issues in negotiations about poverty policy priorities like employment and growth, climate change, financial crisis. Well, those actually happen to be the biggest global challenges of today. You eliminate uh, debates about how you promote development like industrial policies or macroeconomic policies or structural transformation, the role of the state. Um, and in a sense, my conclusion is that in the 1990s, there was such a, a controversy uh, about neoliberal economic reforms. Talking about MDGs allowed everybody to forget about those controversies and just talk about MDGs. <laughs> and so I call it a cover for neoliberal reforms. <laughs> and the second part of this book is about global goals and the kinds of effects that they have. Um, and so there are chapters on the sociology of knowledge on the use of indicators, um, how, and so concrete case studies on how indicators perverted human rights priorities, and how actually the way that the, these indicators are used is faulty because they are uh, evaluating the performance of countries by whether the target was met regardless of where a country started from. What you should really do is to see whether the pace of progress was accelerated. So the cover of this book uh, tells you, in fact, the a message. It's a picture of drifting targets amid scattered arrows. Um, so convey the message of the book. Misdirected, misleading measures and country performance gauged against a single target, regardless of the starting point. Global goals are seemingly scientific measures, but the development process is nonlinear and unpredictable. MDGs could stand for mostly deficient measure. And just to finish one word in con contrast, the SDGs, this is a vehicle for a new idea of development, new paradigm of development, a sustainable development. So it replaces the competing idea of development as ending absolute poverty. And if you study the negotiations that went on to create the SDGs, you realize actually this was deliberate. People, countries, NGOs that were dissatisfied with this narrative of development as just ending poverty as just being much too narrow, uh, actually pushed for this bigger, bigger notion of sustainable development goals. And so we have these things, 17 goals, 169 targets, 232 indicators. They're not simple. <laughs> they, they try to be quantitative, but they are a lot of qualitative targets. And they are uh, concrete only in some areas. And they've created this indicator framework, uh, which has become a sort of a nightmare. Uh, they, they, they require the data collection for 169 indicators is massive. And many of the data are not yet defined. And so there's a huge effort needed to develop new measurement tools. So uh, that, I think, just shows you the kind of inherent contradictions in the, this tool called Global Goals. Um, and it's therefore not a very good way of uh, setting 
international development agendas. Thank you. <clears throat> Oh, and it, sorry for the self-publicity. If you want to get a copy of the book, I have a lot of these uh, uh, flyers with a 20% 20 discount. Thanks to Dr. Sakiko Fukudapar. I um, will ask Dr. Keith Norse. Sí, para el público vamos a, a dar la palabra a los, a los ponentes y después vamos a tener tiempo para preguntas del, del auditorio. Ok, um, Dr. Keith Norris es Executive Director en UWI Consulting, World Trail Organization Chair at the University of the West Indies and former director of the CDRAP Ramphal Center for International Trade Law, Policy and Services, University of the West Indies, Barbados. Worked as a consultant to governments and international regional agencies, such as the OAS South Center, IDBMIF, Commonwealth Secretariat, CARICOM Secretariat, UNESCO, UNICLAB, UNIDO, and the Medical Research Council, UK. He served as an advisor to the World Trade Organization Chairs Program, the ACP Interregional Migra Migration Observatory, the OAS Inter-American Cultural Policy Observatory, and the OECD Knowledge Networks and Markets Project, and the MA in Technology Governance at the University of Tallinn, Estonia. He teaches trade and innovation and has published numerous books and articles on globalization, trade policy, diaspora, creative economy, tourism, innovation governance, and climate change. He is currently on the editorial board of the academic journals Feminist Economics, Island Studies, African Migration and Development Review, and the Anthem Press Other Canon Series. He's also the executive producer of the documentary For World Home, The Power of the Caribbean Diaspora. Holds a PhD in International Relations from the Institute of International Relations, University of West Indies, Trinidad and Tobago. Thank you very much. Uh, Moderator, uh, thank you very much to the organizers for inviting me to participate in this session. Uh, thanks very much to Sakiko for getting the ball rolling <laughs> and, uh, and really setting the stage for the discussion on sustainable development goals. I will speak to the issue of global migration, diasporas, and the sustainable development goals. And uh, I think it's really opportune for me to speak about this here in Mexico, given that Mexico is one of those countries that uh, uh, has a large migrant population abroad, a large diaspora, and uh, benefits from it in significant ways. It's also that Mexico provides uh, a useful example of what other countries could be doing in terms of diasporic engagement. But let me uh, start. Uh, first off, migration is a very contentious issue, has always been, but in the context of a global economic crisis has become even more heated. In fact, if you turn on your television to watch any of the global news channels, um, migration is often a topic of discussion. And it's often highly charged with lots of images 
and misinterpretations of the reality. So, for example, on the news this morning on CNN, there was a discussion about um, migration. The director for the Institute of the International Organization for Migration was making the point that migrants only represent a very small share of the global population. In fact, as I will show, it's only 3.5%. Or that in the case of Europe, where migration is becoming such a very sensitive issue, um, that migrants only represent no more than about 2% of the population in Europe. Uh, the other key point that is, that is often not taken into account is that uh, migrants um, and migration is a powerful tool for reducing poverty. And uh, this has been the case particularly for Europe. We live in the Americas, and the Americas was a major recipient of migrants from Europe in the 19th, 18th, 19th, and 20th century. In fact, several countries in Europe, their, the economies benefited from what we call the vent for surplus, and, uh, and is a key element of the development equation for the now developed economies. So it's a bit ironic that they are super critical of migration when in fact they benefited in so many significant ways. I'll give some more examples as we proceed. But from the standpoint of the Sustainable Development Goals, migrants are probably one of the most vulnerable groups. Uh, they're easy targets for politicians, um, largely because they have very few political rights. And this is applicable in almost every country I can think of. I'm not just picking on the developed market economies. I'm also thinking of countries where, um, in the South, where uh, there are significant migration flows. In fact, more than half of global migration is now South-South migration, rather than just South to North. A few years ago, um, The Economist magazine had an article talking about the magic of diasporas and how, and it's interesting to read the tagline. It says that immigrant networks are a rare, bright spark in the world economy. Rich countries should welcome them. Well, I don't think most of the politicians have read this issue of The Economist magazine. And if they did, um, they are doing quite the opposite. Uh, migration, we know, uh, has significant benefits both to the sending countries, the whole Venford surplus population argument. It also has significant benefits for the home economies or the receiving economies. Uh, so, for example, if you go to New York or to Toronto or to London, uh, more than half of the people working in the services sector in, the, in tourism, but also in high-end industries like ICTs, are migrants. So, for example, one of my cousins, her uh, husband works in the information and communication sector in London. And he says to me that 70% of the people he encounters as IT engineers and so on were not born in the UK and are recent migrants. So, both at the low end and at the high end, um, developed economies benefit in significant ways from migration. There are some downsides, of course. In developing countries where that are major senders, particularly small countries like the ones that I come from in the Caribbean, we export as much as 60 to 90% of our tertiary educated population. And so we are very concerned about the high level of what we call global po poaching of our highly trained um, individuals. And it's defined as brain drain, uh, but it's a major issue for small countries. For larger countries like Mexico, 
uh, it's less of a problem. Uh, but for small economies, it's the case. But for many of the least developed countries, which we discuss when we meet at, as the Committee for Development Policy, um, some of them are large countries with large populations, but there's a high leakage of the highly trained people in key sectors, like in health, like in education, and in science and technology. And so even though as a share of the population it is small, um, these number of migrants, the impact that they have on key sectors is very significant. When you look at the Sustainable Development Goals, migration is not addressed directly, it's addressed tangentially. And I've identified four, only four of the key areas. Uh, and the tendency is to focus on migrants as individuals. Um, in the work that I've been doing, there's um, an increased demand for us to look at migrants as social communities. And that's where we see the significant benefits arising from migration and the growth of diasporas. So, in, argue, in, in effect, I'm arguing that we need to move beyond the Sustainable Development Goals agenda as it relates to migration. Although it does signal for the first time that migration is being recognized as a global development issue. I've identified here Norway, Italy, and Ireland as three examples of countries that benefited um, from migration. Um, Norway exported close to 25% of this population between the late 19th century and the early 20th century. Uh, Italy, it's over 35%, and Ireland is close to 40% of its population. In fact, for all of Western Europe, it's estimated somewhere between 25 and 45% of the population migrated, particularly to the Americas. Um, I made a presentation along these lines when I was in Germany recently. Um, Germans are the number one migrant group in the United States. There are over 50 million people in the United States, 40 to 50 million people who can claim to have German heritage. Uh, the impact that it has on the German economy or had on the German economy is very significant. But if you look at the economics literature, it's largely absent in the debate. And that's, there is a blind spot in migration development debate where it's only focused now on developing countries migrating to the now developed economies. So we need to change that debate. Secondly, if you look at the contemporary flows, remittances and other flows associated with migration have now trumped, no pun intended, um, they, they've trumped foreign direct investment, they've trumped overseas development assistance, and they've trumped um, or supplanted debt financing as major flows into developing economies. And, uh, and in many respects, um, migration has become a new champion in the development equation. This is just some data showing you the growth of um, my remittances to key regions in the developing world. It's only in the last two years or so there's been a bit of a dip. Uh, has to do with the price of oil, currency flows, but also the recessionary impact in some of the developed market economies. So we're looking at it very closely in coming years to see how it flows. Uh, what's also interesting is not just remittances, it's the quantum of income and the savings that diaspora communities have, and they're quite substantial so that um, there's a source of, um, of resources that uh, countries are beginning to tap into. So here in Mexico, at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, there's a whole diasporic engagement strategy now to focus on Mexicans abroad, um, to encourage investment, to facilitate trade, um, to target um, issues of, of intellectual property, and so on. And this is just to give you an example of for some of the least developed countries, the impact that uh, diasporic savings and income can have on, on their economies. Um, but I won't go into all of the details. Let me just um, try and conclude my presentation. Uh, 
in effect, I'm arguing that we need to be thinking about a new development equation of which diasporas and migrants become a critical part of the equation. This is true for almost every developing country. For the small ones, it's more impactful. But even for large countries like Mexico, India, Brazil, and so on, they've developed strong, clearly defined diaspora engagement strategies. Things like remittances are only the tip of the iceberg. So, for example, you go to a country like uh, El Salvador, 10% of their exports to the United States are directly targeted at their diaspora. Um, so it's becoming a major trade issue. Things like diasporic savings and bonds um, in some African countries um, is becoming a very significant source of um, investment flows. And then there's diaspora travel and, and tourism, mobile banking, um, mortgages. For example, in the case of Jamaica, um, 2 percent of their GDP comes from diasporas investing in mortgages at home. That's just mortgages um, alone. And then there's telecoms, uh, which is a huge area of growth and things like creative exports. So I have recently done a re some research for the Commonwealth Secretariat mapping all of these flows. This is the diagram I've used to, um, to explain it all. Uh, I won't go into the details. Um, and I, I make some clear conclusions at the end that argue that the, the diasporic economy is a major growth trend, um, that it helps to expand the trading goods and services as well as intellectual property, it has a positive trade impact for many developing countries. Uh, it reduces informational asymmetries because the diaspora are able to operate in, the, in the, both sending and the host markets. And diaspora entrepreneurs often operate as, um, as co-creators and, and institutional influencers and so on. Now, the reason why I'm making this argument is that the work that we are doing at the um, CDP, the Committee for Development Policy, is focused on looking at production transformation among least developed countries. And uh, in effect, I'm arguing that tapping into the diaspora is a uh, critical means of facilitating that process. Thank you very much for your time and attention. Many thanks to Dr. Keith Norse. And I will ask um, Dr. Mark Florbe. First, I will give his main data. He is Robert E. Kuen, Professor in Economics and Humanistic Studies, Professor of Public Affairs and the University Center for Human Values, Woodrow Wilson School, Princeton University, and former researcher, CNRS Cercers, University Paris Descartes, coordinating editor of Social Choice and Welfare, and former co-editor of Economics and Philosophy. Main areas of research are concerned with normative and public economics and theories of distributive justice. He published numerous books and papers, including Fairness, Responsibility, and Welfare, and co author of Beyond GDP and Theory of Fairness and Social Welfare. He holds a PhD in economics from called the Sot Etude Ancien Social Paris. So let me also thank the organizers for uh, having this event and this conversation with you here today. So um, when we were asked to uh, reflect on the inequalities and the SDGs, I thought I would like to make three points and I'll, I'll be rather short. So the three points I want to make are First, that um, hope can be uh, obtained from looking at the variations of inequalities uh, in various countries. We see a lot of differences, so it's not as if inequality was uh, irredeemably increasing everywhere. We don't see that. We see a lot of variation, especially since the turn of the, of the century. Um, the second point is, uh, so I will develop a little bit later. The second point is that um, 
um, when we think of developing countries, actually, um, equality can be um, a promising development strategy, and I'll try to explain uh, what that means. And finally, uh, reflecting on the political, and that connects a bit to what Sakiko was saying, on the political clout of the SDGs, I would like to argue that, indeed, uh, I agree very much with Sakiko, and they are missing some key elements, and we need something slightly different to uh, create a momentum for, uh, for progress. I, I want to emphasize that what I will be saying is based on collective work. It's not uh, my personal book. <laughs> it's a collective work that involves about 300 people, actually, from all over the world. Um, and we have just finished a report uh, that is very big, that will be published uh, by Cambridge University Press in three volumes. Um, so you can uh, find the chapter drafts online on our website. You have the address here. And you can also follow more um, general audience publications, for instance, like in the, the conversation, this academic uh, blog. Uh, so you are very welcome to visit these, um, these uh, sources. So let me briefly elaborate on the, on the three points. So first, um, on the variations across countries, I'm relying here on a chapter that uh, was uh, uh, heavily um, indebted to contributions by Stefan Klaassen and uh, Andrea Cornia, who should have been here and could not come uh, because of health issues. So I thought I should uh, somehow make them present uh, through a presentation of what they uh, did um, in, this, uh, in that work. And so you have a description, in, uh, the chapter is very long and contains many discussions of policies, but let me just focus on this point, which is uh, observations of the trends among countries where you see a lot of variation. So it's true that in the OECD, uh, you've uh, seen a lot of inequality rising in many countries, but you see other things in other countries. So uh, you also have rising inequality in South Asia and Indonesia, um, uh, along with rapid growth. But you had a moderate inequality decline in Southeast and East Asia after the financial uh, 1997 crisis. China had a sharp rise in inequality and then uh, a modest decline with a change in policy uh, focus and institutions. Africa is all over the place in terms of uh, uh, trends in inequalities. And I, I'll show the, the trends can be up, down, the U-shaped or inverted U-shaped. Um, depending on, depending not necessarily on things that governments can easily control, but depending in particular on the various sectoral developments. So some sectors have more concentration of assets and are more conducive to increasing inequalities, and other sectors uh, like agriculture, for instance, may be more conducive to a reduction of inequalities. And Latin America, where we are here, as a as a good record, as you know, uh, since uh, since the early uh, the beginning of the century, uh, thanks in particular to a reduction in the skill premium uh, linked to um, uh, education achievements, and and thanks to um, to welfare policies. Uh, so let me just quickly go through the the uh, a few. Um, slides that illustrate this thing. So rising inequality in the OECD, all these arrows that go up for various countries. Um, and let me illustrate. So this is something that was prepared by Andrea Cornia. Uh, you have a classification of countries or so groups of countries where you have a declining trend. So this is in terms of the Gini uh, coefficient in, in these uh, groups of countries, rising trends. And, and you have also these uh, U-shaped and inverted U-shaped. So you, you see really uh, that um, we are not in a world that is condemned to see a growing inequalities everywhere. And Latin America, this is a sort of synthesis that has also been done by Andrea Cornia, where um, you see a nice decline. Still, uh, the uh, current situation is quite high in world standards, right? We are still uh, well above uh, 40%, uh, when, but, and still above 45% actually for the Gini, but nevertheless, it has been an impressive decline. So that suggests um, to look at the future and see if we can hope for a continuation of the good trends where we have seen good trends. And there is another chapter in this big report um, where the Norwegian uh, Karl Uwe Moene and the Uruguayan uh, Fernando Filguera in particular have developed this idea that equality can be a development uh, strategy. And that goes against the view that um, development uh, should follow a sort of Kuznetsk where inequalities have to grow first because some people take off and others are left behind for at least for a while. Um, and so the, the thesis here is that you can um, do something different. And one element of this uh, equality strategy is to um, 
look at the uh, creative destruction process um, of uh, technology uh, innovation and diffusion, where if you uh, manage to uh, engineer wage compression, so reduction of the uh, wage inequalities within firms, but also, and quite importantly, um, uh, between sectors. And we've seen uh, recently in uh, developed countries um, a lot of increase in inequalities between sectors. Um, and, and so if you can um, avoid that through different ways, uh, you can have central policies like minimum wage policies, or you can have um, uh, policies which rely on central uh, bargaining between the social partners, uh, unions and employers and so on. So that's the first pillar of this uh, strategy, wage compression, which um, the nice thing about it is that it forces employers to adopt, to modernize and to adopt uh, uh, technologies. And so you see that the countries where this is uh, happening, where wage compression is happening, um, you have a much more modern productive sector throughout the sectors, uh, throughout the, the industries, uh, than in countries where you have wage dispersion and, uh, and a lot of uh, sectors and firms uh, using outdated technologies. The second pillar is, um, is more um, in terms of government policy. And the idea here is that equality can be um, understood as the, the expansion of the capabilities of the people via social policies which invest in human capital, education, health, and uh, various cares, uh, care, care policy, child care, elderly care and so on. And so the idea here is to improve, of course, uh, human capital and the productivity of the people, but also through um, the security that they have to empower them in front of the market uh, situation, and especially to empower workers in front of, of the uh, employers. Um, and uh, the idea here is that developing countries need not wait until they have reached a high level of development uh, before they can start doing that. They can actually invest in their uh, population and reap the uh, rewards of that. So it's a, a very profitable investment in economic terms. And there is an interaction between these two pillars of this strategy. Um, uh, equality leads actually in the political economy uh, game, um, leads to greater solidarity in the population. People feel closer to one another and therefore more willing to share the risks and therefore you have a greater demand for the welfare state. So you can have a <laughs> virtuous circle and you can see, of course, when countries that go the other direction, vicious circles where people are coming apart and are less supportive of welfare policies. Um, there is a part of this um, uh, text that uh, suggests ideas from Scandinavia for Latin America. So I will, I will skip to that perhaps because uh, I can't read, it's too far from where I am. But, um, but I encourage you, if you are interested, I can, I can uh, share this. It's a sh text that is not too long and is a bit provocative, saying that uh, sc the Scandinavian mother, actually the Scandinavian countries were rather poor uh, in the early 20th century, and they have managed to develop along with the development of egalitarian policies, right? And not in spite of egalitarian policies. So that's an interesting example. Um, and let me just now uh, say a few words about the third point, this uh, problem of the SDGs, which are not very exciting. And I guess Sakiko was uh, uh, saying that perhaps the MDGs and oh, the SDGs to some extent uh, share the same problem of somehow enabling business as usual under a discourse of uh, transformation. Um, and they, they are not really generating a lot of political momentum. Why that? Well, in part because they are not very precise on the institutional changes that should be uh, implemented to, um, to, to make uh, these transformations. And so the, uh, the report uh, of our panel on social progress is really uh, stressing governance issues and saying that really the, the, the thing where change needs to be done is on the um, uh, on governance, both for um, making implementation uh, effective and for the sake of it, for the fact that people um, need to be empowered and they will be empowered if they can really participate in the decisions that are made. And this leads to concrete proposals for reforming labor relations, including a reform of the corporation, the governance of the corporation and the purpose of the corporation, uh, a need to reform welfare relations and the way uh, state uh, aid is uh, provided to uh, recipients, and also something happening with the media. Uh, so 
um, I won't uh, develop about fake news and things like that, but uh, there, are, there are interesting problems with uh, democratic governance of the media, and so we need to think of, of that. And so the vision that um, is emerging in this collective text is a vision of a democratic economy where people really participate, including in the workplace, where the state is no longer a welfare state, but is more like an emancipating state, and, um, and something um, of a reform of the de governance of the media, where they would be treated more like a public good than um, a commercial business. Yeah. Okay, many thanks. And Dr. Marc Florbe. Uh, we'll ask uh, Dr. Leticia Merino to come to the front. Um, Invitar a Leticia Merino a que pase. In the meanwhile, I will present uh, Leticia. Full semester degree in population for Jawaharlal Nehru University, India, and a PhD in anthropology from the Universidad Nacional Autónoma de México, and has undertaken postdoctoral studies at the Vincent and Eleanor Ostrom Workshop in Political Theory and Policy Analysis at Indiana University. She has worked extensively on the contribution of natural resources to the livelihoods of rural communities, particularly the rural poor in Mexico and Central America. Specialized in environmental governance, focusing on collective property, collective action, and more recently, the impacts of out-migration on the natural commons, and the impacts of policies on the livelihoods of the rural poor and on community She has been an invited teacher at the Latin American Faculty of Social Sciences, Guatemala, the University of Gloucestershire, United Kingdom, the University of Cordoba, and the University of Navarra, Spain. Well, I think I'll thank you very much. And after so good so excellent presentations. I mean, I don't have a presentation, so but I won't, don't want to miss the opportunity to to present some of the ideas on inequality and environment, inequality and sustainability that I have been working together with Ayari Pasquier during the the last the last uh, year or so. Um, I'm talking in English, in Spanish. Uh, because it's easier for us to translate from English into Spanish. So, I mean, I talk very long. Uh, I think the world, the, I mean, the last years, I have had the chance, the privilege to work for the IPBS, the International Panel on Biodiversity and Ecosystems, and have a more or less comprehensive uh, view of the way the, the environment is changing and the main trends of the deterioration and I don't want to 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 start crying here about about the tragedy of the global commons or the local environmental commons but um, there are very worrisome trends in the way water is managed in the where forests are managed in the where the subsoil is used and managed I'm talking about oil fracking and and mining which is particularly expanded and important in Latin America with uh, with social and environmental very serious impacts um, and this for me and for I mean this is a new field there is no very much written or research on inequality and environmental terms there are some works uh, we just uh, finished a literature review with, with Ajari, but I think it's a very interesting way 
of looking at the environment. From my recent work on, on global uh, environmental analysis, I and Mexican analysis of the Mexican conditions here in the seminar of uh, of, of society and environment of the university, I have an increasing feeling that uh, environmental terms are moving or need to be regarded different from a cosmetic or a secondary uh, aspect of social life, I mean less important than development or employment, and becoming an urgent um, issue to, to deal with in local terms, in national terms, in global terms, and it's very much related to inequality in through dif diverse dimensions. These are general ideas, and I hope in the coming future there will be more, a body of research emerging on, on how inequality affect our, our chances to have uh, a more healthy environment or, or to halter the deterioration of global commons such as the atmosphere or the erosion of biodiversity. One first dimension, one first path in which inequality relates to environmental terms, in my view, it's vulnerability. Vulnerability regarded as the, the impact, the exposure to, to, to how do you say, impactos, to, to, I'm losing my English, to, no, to negative impacts. I mean, in, uh, vulnerability is defined as a, as the exposure to to negative impacts, but it's also defined as how much you have the capacity to answer, to respond in a resilient manner to these to these impacts. And what we can regard and we see in local and global terms is that those most exposed to environmental negative impacts, disasters it was, it was the, the way, the world I was trying to avoid, and who have less instrument to respond to, to global environmental ch challenges or local environmental ch challenges are those who are alre already vulnerable in social and economic terms. I mean, the poor are those who suffer more the, the impacts of, of environmental uh, changes or environmental uh, trends of environmental deterioration. Another pattern, another dimension, another way of, of analyzing how inequality affects uh, environment is through collective action. I mean, Keith was, I think it was Keith or Mark, was were mentioning how inequality or how equality and trust relate how in more equal societies people are more willing to cooperate, are more willing and more tending to trust each other, uh, and how in more unequal societies such as Mexico, which is uh, perhaps the or one of the most unequal countries in Latin America, I mean the, the trends uh, Mark was showing about how uh, Latin America uh, how inequality decreased in Latin America do not include Mexico. In Mexico, this didn't happen during the last 15, 20 years. We never had a left center or social democratic governments, government investing in, in public uh, goods, in public services. And the, the public investment in education and health had been uh, constantly uh, re uh, getting reduced, reducing, in, in Mexico. So the idea here is that inequality um, hinders, affects collective action, neither to defend, neither to create, neither to preserve environmental goods. We cannot defend, we cannot clean uh, water sources or a, or a forest or a green area in the cities by an individual effort. I mean, we need a collectivity of different scales, even here in the university. So in more, in less equal societies, collective action becomes a scarce and social capital trust becomes a scarce uh, good. A third way in which inequality relates, in my view, 
with environmental processes, with environmental goods, it's quite called procedural inequality. Inequality is not only, uh, it's cultural, it's economic, it's political. So the poor, and particularly the poor in countries with a colonial past, like Mexico and most of, well, Latin America, it's the region of the world with the longest colonial uh, history, economic inequality and political inequality are very closely related. This is called in very often uh, elite capture. That means the decision making power over key goods, whether in the cities, I mean, we had an important uh, session coordinated by Alice the other days about how the the uh, immobiliarias, the, the the building companies, I don't know how to real say, uh, real estate uh, is is growing and is eating popular neighborhoods, and it's affecting the water bodies and and so on, and due to to our lack of of reduced uh, political voice, some laws have passed in the in the last years in Mexico and Latin America in spite of the tradition of social movements on environmental field, uh, we have had, I mean, the, in the last 10 years, a change in laws favoring mining companies, favoring uh, oil companies, uh, favoring land grabbing for the production of biofuels or, or, or food crops, which are, whose prices are settled in the by the financial sector, not locally, with uh, very pervasive environmental and social consequences. So the political inequality, what's called procedural inequality, the lack of democracy, the lack of real democracy, it's another very important way in which uh, inequality affects local, national, and global uh, environmental goods. And finally, I think there's uh, there's evidence on that about the impacts on inequality of inequality on consumption patterns, uh, even within rich societies, even with uh, within developed countries, developed countries, rich countries with less or more inequality have very different consumption patterns in terms of food, in terms of 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 energy consumption, in terms of of investment. I mean, in terms of generation of waste. I mean, more equal societies like Scandinavia. Well, I have read that. I don't know if Sakiko would correct me or not about Japan or, or Korea, countries which are less unequal with same level or more or less same level of income have, have more environmental conscious uh, consumption patterns that rich countries with high inequality levels, such as the US, which is the the icon and uh, the United Kingdom and Singapore. Well, I th perhaps Singapore, it's a little different. So, I mean, these are my four points, the four points I wanted to make, which I hope are uh, sources of hypotheses, sources of questions about, about uh, the way in which inequality and the environment link. And my main message would be that without addressing inequality in global, national, and local terms, it's almost impossible to resolve uh, sustainability uh, problems, sustainability issues. I mean, I'm also presenting a, a paper in the report that the, the committee is making on these issues with a bit more detail and the message we see analyzing different cases, it's very clear. I mean, in a, without addressing inequalities, most of the sustainable development goals, but very concretely, sustainable consumption, uh, conservation of biodiversity in the ocean and by terrestrial uh, biodiversity in which water, in which the, our life depends. And this is more and more clear. I mean, these goals cannot be achieved if the diverse ways in which inequality works are not properly addressed by civil society. And I don't think this is 
only or mainly a question of policy making, obviously it is, but it's a question in countries like Mexico and Central America of mobilization of civil society, of academia, of communities, demanding changes in inequality and more environmental justice. So thank you. Excuse me for this panel. Very nice, very nice. Thanks, uh, Dr. Leticia. Uh, first time ever. Bueno, uh, vamos a pedir preguntas al público. Las pueden decir en inglés o en español. Nosotros podemos traducir en, si es el caso. Um, Carlos, Hola, buenas tardes. Yo le voy a pedir a alguno de los organizadores que me traduzca a la pregunta en inglés, si es posible. Y bueno, Perdón. antes… ¿sí? No, ellos, yo quisiera hablar en español y que ellos me entendieran en inglés. Bueno. She, wants, she wants translation, so… Ok, bueno, eh, antes que nada quisiera agradecer a los… I would like to thank… Ah. A los, organ... no, yo estoy bien. a los organizadores y a los ponentes por esta sesión y mi pregunta es la siguiente, eh, me pareció muy interesante la, la exposición sobre las distintas tendencias de la desigualdad del profesor, um, no, no, logro ver, sí, eh, no logro leer el nombre desde aquí, lo siento, eh, sin embargo, ¿cómo lo menciona la ponencia sobre como lo menciona la ponencia sobre migración y como lo hemos visto en el estudio de los impactos de la desigualdad en el manejo de recursos naturales, muchas veces eh, las desigualdades que están impactando de manera importante son las desigualdades globales, ¿no? que son eh, uno de los mo grandes motores eh, de las diásporas migratorias y de todo el drama en términos de derechos humanos que se observa por ejemplo en el Mediterráneo Europeo, eh, o en la frontera mexicana, pero también de las incapacidades de enfrentar los nuevos retos en términos de manejo de recursos naturales, en donde a pesar de una histórica eh, capacidad de manejo y de gestión de los recursos, de repente surgen nuevos retos vinculados con las desigualdades globales que las comunidades ya no pueden este, enfrentar. Entonces, en estos términos, quería preguntarle al profesor si tienen datos de cómo ha, eh, de cuáles son las dinámicas en términos de desigualdad global, no únicamente eh, en términos de desigualdad por países. Gracias. ¿Es it clear? I think it's to both of you. want me to translate to make yeah. a summary? Yeah. Okay, I mean, Ajari was asking, was, as, was making several questions. In the beginning she was talking and she was, I think it was a question for you, perhaps for Sakiko as well, uh, about which are the trends of global inequality. I mean, not only inequality within countries, but inequality between countries. As a driver of migration, which is good and bad, I mean, which has downsides and positive sides, uh, but it's also a source of very important human rights violation in the Mediterranean, in Europe, and in the northern border of Mexico, where a thousand people die every year. And um, well, I think it was a, one part of the questions, I mean, which, is the, which are the trends of inequality seen as a, in, global, in global terms and its implications for for migration and also she was mentioning or she wanted i think that keith to to develop a little bit on the impacts of migration on local communities that are aging and lose capacities to protect or govern or develop patterns of sustainable use of natural resources that's another way of in which inequality affects Yeah, thank you very much. Perhaps if you want, I can start on the global, yeah? 
Okay, yeah, yeah, but you can complete if you want. Yeah, so on global inequality trends, um, indeed, um, uh, people sometimes say we should be satisfied because we've observed the, the global statistics uh, look good and there, is a, there has been a very substantial reduction in poverty at the global level. But if you look at the distribution of that over the world, it's very, very concentrated on East Asia. China is the key place where things have been good. Um, but if you look at other parts of the world, uh, it's much uh, less uh, promising. And especially uh, if we talk about migrations, Afri Africa, many countries in Africa are left behind and development is not, uh, is not, I mean, catching up is not happening there. And therefore, this is a very, very serious worry. And that's connected to another issue, which is uh, the demographic transition not happening in Africa. And so we have two problems there. We have a problem of being left behind in terms of uh, living standards, which creates, of course, an aspiration to move elsewhere. But also there will be a big population bulge uh, if things continue the way they, they go, uh, which will create a push for uh, putting um, having people go abroad. So both a push and a pull mechanism will create potentially a big migration crisis if things continue. The, those are pretty good questions. Um, just to take off from where Mark ended, uh, the, there's a major uh, demographic imbalance in the global economy. in several locations. Uh, so in Europe, the, the median age is now 40. Uh, I mean, some African countries is as low as 14. Uh, and so you have an aging population in Europe and in North America and Japan, but also in China, um, places like Singapore. Uh, so many of the high income economies and the middle income economies are running out of replacement labor and their capacity to afford uh, pension schemes and so on uh, are almost at close to a crisis point. It's also that in many of these economies uh, the personnel that would be required or personal care services for the aged is also uh, in short supply. Doctors, nurses, home caregivers, and so on. So it's creating a huge demand pull from developing countries to attract labor to developed countries. At the same time, you have a scenario where in most developing countries, a few exceptions, um, very low absorptive capacity of their particularly tertiary educated population. And so you have not enough demand for the labor, the highly skilled labor that is being produced in these developing countries. And in the middle, there are people wanting to build walls to block um, this um, migratory flow. Uh, it's going to be completely unsustainable. And in effect, um, the, the demand for labor from the developing world is only going to increase. All the projections are... are, the, are that it's going to expand and expand very rapidly. So even though the polit politicians are arguing a particular case, the people in industry are asking, you see it in the United States as well, a lot of the CEOs have been um, being very critical of Trump and in very specific areas. So for example, in agriculture, the United States would become a, a larger uh, importer of food if it wasn't for Mexican labor, or labor from Central America, or labor from the Caribbean. Uh, so uh, that is clearly evident. In countries back at home, descending countries, you now have, I think in Mexico, um, 
you may have communities and villages where all of the able-bodied men and women are gone. You also have a phenomenon called the feminization of migration. So female migrants and in several regions now surpass male migrants because the jobs that are in demand in the developed world are for things like care services, nurses, teachers, etc. So the feminization of migration is another critical factor. And so the impact that they're having on their home countries is uh, that one, those skills are being in, in, are now in short supply. Two, you now have um, communities that are now over reliant on uh, things like remittance flows, uh, what we call in the Caribbean barrel goods. Um, families abroad send everything for their children back home school books, shoes, computers, <laughs> phones, <laughs> uh, and uh, what we call creating a barrel culture, so a culture of migration. On the upside, though, you see that there are, is increasing organization between migrant communities abroad and their home, what we call home tongue or home tongue associations. And in several of these particularly in Mexico and other Central American countries. Um, it is these communities that are fixing the schools, fixing the hospitals, um, building roads, doing things that the state was never able to do, that international aid was never able to touch. Um, in case of Jamaica, this, the, the, the recent reduction of inequality and poverty is primarily related to migration and to remittance flows. It has nothing to do with the government, has nothing to do with foreign aid, has nothing to do with foreign investment, and it's happening all over Latin America and the Caribbean. In parts of Africa, though, um, the impact has not been as significant because in relative terms, the migrants are uh, as a smaller share of the society and very concentrated in particular um, professions. So it's a mixed bag, sort of like what um, Mark was describing. In different regions, you can see different impacts. Uh, and you're right, at the border, uh, you have a trade in migration. Uh, there are people who are speculating and offering services to move migrants across borders. So the more stringent the border controls, the higher the price tag for those migration services <laughs> and the transaction costs associated. And it becomes increasingly criminalized and, uh, and can be very, very dangerous. Uh, I think it's well documented. Um, there, are much, there are lots of movies about it. Um, describing the, the predicament for migrants. And, uh, there's, however, there's very little traction at the global level to deal with these issues. The process is going to continue unabated. Um, our governments are going to be increasingly um, conservative and regressive. And migrants are going to become an even more vulnerable group, uh, um, I would expect. Thank you very much. I'd like to add something. I mean, we work years ago on migration and impacts on migration on local communities in Mexico. And just to comment two things, I mean, the cost, the, the cost of the cost what migrants had to pay from central Mexico to enter the United States working with what we call a coyote, I mean, uh, take the migrants to the to the other side of the border. Two years ago, was ten thousand dollars. I mean, for for an indigenous or for an unemployed or for a peasant, it's it's a lot. So they have to to 
on working for the for a contractor for two or three years in order to be able to pay for their crossing. And the other thing about, I mean, Keith was mentioning that the government of Mexico had developed strategies to synergize the resources and the goodwill of the, the diasporas. Um, the program called uh, two per one, dos por uno, or tres por uno, three per one was mon the municipal government, the federal government, and the state government. The problem is that, I mean, with the corporative tradition, the, the democratic tradition that characterizes governance in Mexico, uh, this this goodwill, this tradition of philanthropy of the diasporas in places like Zacatecas, more, more migrants, it's, it's uh, becoming less and less frequent because it's controlled by the government. It's the municipal government or the, the state government who decides on the priorities on uh, which investment need to be made, who chooses the contractors. So it ends up being a business for the local government and very very frequently it's used with uh, electoral purposes so again it's the the thing that without a decent government basic democracy i mean even the philanthropy of people who are, who are poor it's, uh, it's obstructed En español. Uh -huh. Al principio dijeron que la meta. ¿Puedes hablar despacito para que. Okay. Uh -huh. La meta de desigualdad en las Naciones Unidas es el número 10. Y mi pregunta es: ¿cuál es el 1? ¿Cuál es el 2? ¿Qué es lo, lo principal? Porque 10 se me hace ya bastante secundario. Uh, well, I think uh, there, are, um, there are 17 goals, but the order of the goals does not mean that there is number one is more important than number two. The, all 17 are equally the same. Uh, but, um, but I will tell you that uh, the first goal is to end poverty. And uh, so I'll just grab this <laughs> opportunity to comment that there is a confusion between inequality and poverty that a lot of people talk about inequality, but actually what they're talking about is poverty. Because when we talk about inequality, we talk about the problem of the deprived. People who are deprived of income, people who are deprived of ac access to land, who don't have access to schooling, and you know, people who are vulnerable, so these are the terms that we use to talk about inequality. But um, if you refer to the uh, data, for example, that Mark was showing, uh, he was showing the Gini coefficient, which is about distribution uh, of uh, income. It's not about the poor. Uh, so when we talk about inequality, there are many ways that we talk about inequality. We can focus on those who are at the bottom and who are deprived. But the important difference between poverty and inequality is inequality is about the top and the bottom and the middle. And today we have two problems. We have the problem of too many people who are at the bottom and not getting enough. Wages are not going up. Productivity is going up, but wages are not going up. At the top, the top 1% is 
is increasing income. So if you look at many of the charts, you see this kind of thing, that the, that the distribution curves look like this, that the 1% has a huge amount. And it's not even the top 10% is the 1%. And the incomes and the wealth of the top 1% has been increasing very rapidly. And so then I refer to some of the uh, comments that uh, Leticia made about what she called procedural inequality, that it leads to too much, not just wealth, but political power on the part of this elite, right? So inequality has a social impact. It has a political impact and it has an economic impact. So inequality is a problem that is very different from poverty. And I think this is something that we need to keep in mind. I think Sakiko, Sakiko answered. I was just going to add that it's it's uh, and obviously the the SDG goals are interrelated. Number two, it refers to some or others talk about education and access to water and sanitation, uh, to decent uh, work opportunities, but. Uh, Trying to well thinking about the the I would like to to say that yes I mean inequality it's it's different from poverty though they are related and for me it's very important inequality it's a very come on this incomodo it's an issue that's not very popular between uh, policy makers or or elites, it's it's an uncomfortable thing, I would say, that was absent from the political agenda for 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 many decades. And for me, I mean, with all the limitations of the global goals and the SDGs and the ecosystem assessment goals, I mean the fact that inequality is considered as a sustainable development goal gives me the terms and it's important uh, in itself, and I would say many of the of the sustainable development goals, in my view, are impossible or to to reach without addressing, as I said, uh, inequality, not only <coughs> poverty, inequality, because of its social, political, and also I would say environmental dimensions. Um, I, I, if I may add one one comment, I, I, I was expecting that Sakiko would also mention that she has a, an, a paper in preparation which is very interesting, where she describes the history of the integration of inequality as uh, one of the goals, as the tenth goal, and it was controversial. And um, and I have just read this paper, and and I. Um, I'm not sure how to interpret, so I, I, perhaps we can continue the conversation, because some people were, were against the introduction of the goal of inequality, um, of course, perhaps for cynical reasons, but perhaps also for, um, for reasons of uh, seeing the difficulties, the political difficulties of implementing this goal. So as Letitia was saying, it's an inconvenient notion. And it's inconvenient because there are different definitions of inequality. There are dimensions. You can be uh, disadvantaged in various aspects of your, of your situation, your life. And also, you can focus on different parts of the distribution. And so, because of all these difficulties, um, as opposed to things which look simpler when you talk about poverty, when you talk about hunger, um, perhaps people were seeing uh, that it would be harder to implement. But certainly, um, yeah, it's it's inconvenient in many ways, and um, and it's quite fortunate that it somehow managed to appear explicitly uh, in the list. Uh, I was watching the um, conference online. Mm. I had a um, class this morning, and it was about making a strategy for 
include um, specific characteristics of some countries with high, low, and medium income. And I represented the low income country, which was Philippines. And I, we could see, my partners and me, we could see that it's uh, very difficult to integrate the specific characteristics of the countries. For example, um, water, uh, use of, uh, used water for, or water for, agriculture or, um, for example, um, for example, Saudi Arabia, which is a, a country very specific in such a desertic place. Um, it, it's very rich and it imports 90% uh, of its food. So, uh, but it can pay for that. So, uh, the context was uh, food. In another country like Filipinas, Philippines, uh, this country is low income, but it will become a medium income, uh, according to the World Bank, uh, by the uh, in mm, twenty years. So there are trends to the future, and. It's not very. Um, we got n we c we couldn't do the strategy because um, how c how can we even think that uh, how can we ask a country uh, to produce its own food if it's that if that is necessary or how can we uh, send food to other parts. And I think this is more inequality, uh, inequity, uh, than it's not poverty. It's uh, desigualdad, inequidad, inequity. Yeah, that that's that, mm, that it is the main difference. The specific context of each uh, of each country, of each place, the specific characteristics. But but they are so different that we uh, we couldn't make the strategy to. Uh, 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 yeah, we couldn't do that because, and we analyzed many variables, many characteristics, and we couldn't. We just, and we uh, assumed the the role the of the country. In, yeah, my question. <laughs> so, in your perspective, in your point of view, uh, how could you integrate? Uh, or uh, the problem that we had is that we we didn't know who we were. If we were scientists, if we were uh, policymakers, like politicians, if we were a civil society, we didn't know who we were, who we, who we had to make those decisions. Um, my question is, which people uh, ha would have the right to be included in a plan, in a global plan, in a global agenda like this? Uh, ¿Qué personas tendrían el derecho o qué personas tendrían como la legitimidad para hacer una estrategia global para resolver problemáticas como como estas? Have the right or the the legitimacy to take part in decision making about global problems. Mm -hmm. uh, there is one aspect of the question that I can perhaps say a few uh, words about, which is the, indeed, the problem that the SDG framework, the sustainable development, is a sort of uniform framework and uh, may not fit all uh, particular situations very well. Um, 
And so there are debates about that. Um, and I know that, uh, but that is, uh, Sakiko should talk about that. There, there have been debates when the SDGs were discussed, when they were formulated about whether um, differences between countries should be explicitly um, uh, described uh, in, in, the, in the main documents. Um, but now there are still debates uh, among the people involved about whether um, we should really insist on having all the goals satisfied everywhere or whether we should uh, have a formulation that is um, more flexible. And one way to think about it, uh, this is my personal view on it, but is that what should ultimately matter is not um, all the particular dimensions. And you were mentioning food security. That's a good example where it may be very hard to achieve it in a, in a standard way in some places. Um, what is important is to look at the well-being of the population yeah. and to achieve something for the populations. And there may be different ways of achieving that for the population. So at some point, instead of just checking that we have the 17 items being uh, checked, we should have a synthesis of all that and see that the population as a whole and in all the relevant dimensions is, is um, improving its situation and is, is, uh, is doing better. So that's one, one um, uh, way of commenting on your, on your question and indeed I think it's an important issue. So um, I was very, uh, very interested by what, what, what you were saying and I'm not sure that I'm going to be able to kind of respond directly, but uh, it made me, provoke me to thinking about uh, the fact that um, the SDGs um, were created in a very interesting process. And uh, I, I, I mean, I personally think that the SDGs are much more promising instrument for stimulating real change uh, than the MDGs. I think that the SDGs have overcome many of the criticisms that I have of the, the, the MDG framework. And one of them is the way that they were formulated. You know, the MDGs were written down by some technocratic person, some economist sitting somewhere in the UN building, and then uh, it was all very logically, uh, beautifully phrased, and, you know, and then it was just sort of uh, given to the governments and say, do you agree with this? And they say yes, and they adopted it. Uh, it was the SDGs were, were formulated through a very, very messy process over almost three years. And they conducted hundreds, thousands of consultations in countries, uh, regionally, and then online thematic consultations on different themes. They had a survey. You know, I don't know how many people participated, maybe certainly in the hundreds of thousands, but also in the UN, you know, you have a room with 200 governments sitting there trying to agree on something. And how do you actually develop something that you agree on? Quite often what happens is that somebody in the secretariat office writes it down and then they, they give it to you. Or else what they often do also is that uh, different country groups get together and then they decide amongst themselves what they're going to do. This was a very strange process because, first of all, the um, it was decided that the SDGs would be created through a special arrangement called the Open Working Group. And it was, for the first time, a, uh, a uh, process that was open to civil society. So usually governments uh, uh, negotiate behind closed doors. And, and for example, trade agreements are negotiated in top secrecy so that only <laughs> the trade representative of Mexico and the United States and Canada, and they sit in lock, behind locked doors and they negotiate NAFTA, you know, they renegotiate NAFTA. This was totally different. It was totally open to the public. And you could walk in and you could hear what they were saying. And, but they also had these formal structures where uh, you had governments who had the right to 
make a decision. But then there were these things called major groups that were、um, NGO groups and civil society groups that were given special role to make、uh, comments at these meetings. So it was a very interesting process that they deliberately changed. The process whereby these international、uh, agreements was actually formulated, and this is why it took so long. That there were all of these discussions everywhere, and it took a long time for <laughs> them to come to it come to a decision.、Um, and and once the other interesting thing is that、um, uh, that they open the process also to business. The first time that that the business sector was very much invited to participate in the process, and then they all said that the business sector should be.、Uh, without the business sector, this cannot be implemented. That was also a,、uh, an interesting new direction, and I, I personally, I am still wondering what this means. You know, a lot of people are critical of it because they say the UN is selling out to corporate corporations,、um, and many of the、um, there's no、uh, there's nothing there that asks corporations to behave in a responsible way, right? So we know that there's a lot of environmental damage done by corporations. For example, we were just talking outside in the garden. Uh, about the、uh, the mining and the、uh, and the environmental damage that that does,、uh, and the kinds of agreements that mining companies may have with local communities, with national governments about who gets the profit from、uh, these resources that are under the ground、uh, in your countries that are your sovereign wealth.、Uh, so, I think that's a really interesting thing. The other the other thing that Mark mentioned about this. Global norms, global standards, global rules, and how they apply in different countries with different conditions, different priorities, different resources. I think that's one of the big、uh, challenges of the twenty first century. You know, so I, I, I think that that in the twenty first century we face these challenges of globalization and a new kind of capitalism. Where we have to deal with the role of the private sector, and we also have to deal with, you know, global flows and global ideas and global rules and global standards, and how to make sense of them at the national level. Okay.、Um. Okay, en cinco minutos que quedan, five minutes left. Y es muy concreta para Sakiko. Quisiera saber si los indicadores que existen sobre desigualdad、eh, son válidos para utilizarse y compararse en diferentes lugares del mundo. Y va un poco de acuerdo a lo que a lo que acabas de contestar, porque pues bueno vemos que hay diferentes tipos de desigualdades, desigualdades ambientales, económicas. Eh, etcétera. Entonces quisiera saber si si podemos tener indicadores globales o, o sería necesario desarrollar indicadores para cada región o para cada problemática que estudiemos.、Oh, sorry.、Um, he... He was asking about different types of inequality, and I think there are two two questions. One, if there are indicators for the different types of inequality, social, political, economic,、um, environment, and also if these, if I took it right, if these, if there there is a need to develop indicators for different scales for global and national, basically. Dimensions of inequality, and I think this was basically. Yeah. Oh, oh, I see what you mean. Well, I, I can just. I, I thought you were asking,、uh, for example, about the SDG. So, in in the work that we are doing、uh, as a group,、uh, we are. 
looking at the SDGs and the way that they have dealt with inequality or with leaving no one behind. And uh, this is one of the uh, criticisms that of the SDG framework that um, they they are uh, they do a lot on uh, the exclusion indicator. So uh, whether um, ethnic group, well, whether like the uh, aged, the, the the youth, the children, uh, women are uh, excluded from uh, education, for example. Uh, but the um, there are different ways of measuring economic inequality, inequality of income and wealth, um, and there's a big gap in the SDG framework on that. There really actually isn't a measure of inequality of income and wealth. Um, and as to different countries, I, I think that's a really interesting question, actually. I haven't really thought about uh, different the relevance of different uh, measures of inequality. And I, I think that in some respects, um, uh, we, need, we need to uh, develop, uh, for example, better measures of uh, and better data for inequality in access to land, for example. We know that there is a huge problem, particularly in uh, countries where access to land is, is really a, a major issue. Um, and in in um, in areas of um, uh, gender and agriculture, for example, uh, the fact that women lack uh, secure title to land or uh, a formal access to land because of inheritance laws and things like that, we we also know that there is a huge gap in data on the um, uh, ownership of land. Uh, that is disaggregated by gender. So um, no, I think I think you raise a very interesting question. I don't have a ready answer for it, but I can think why this is so important. Okay, pues, um, se, pues agradecemos la, la participación de ustedes, la de los ponentes. Um, many thanks for the for the audience, uh, for the speakers. It was a very interesting session and thank you for coming. See you soon.